My name is Rick Bunchu. It's my privilege to be able to share with you uh, again this, this morning. Um, I've been speaking quite a bit this month because uh, my wife and I leave uh, actually Wednesday afternoon. We're going to actually to, on vacation to Germany where we're going to do the Christmas market things with something I just dis- we just discovered and we're going to give those a run. So get your gift list ready for me, you know, um, and I'll try to fulfill it as much as I can. But uh, it's really f- great to be with you. And um, I want to I want to kind of start in the same way with the same vein that Jesus used to do when he taught. Jesus used to the Bible says that Jesus taught by way of stories. And I've always been a sucker for stories and parables and things like that. Things that particularly I liked how Jesus told a parable and then said, go figure it out. So I'm going to do the same thing with you. We're going to start this morning. Um, and we're going to start with a, with a parable, with a story. And your job at the end of the story is to figure out what it's about. Okay, you ready for that one? All right, here we go. Want to roll that? All right, there's your parable for the morning. You can go home. Um, no, just find somebody you came with, didn't come with. Tell them what you think it's about. And some of you are going, I have no idea. Can you show it again? What do you think it's about? By the way, it's okay to have a bunch of different ideas of what it's about. <laughs> Parables are kind of like that. They, can, they have lessons on many levels. So somebody give me an idea of what, what, do you, what, what was it about to you? Gratitude. Gratitude. Okay, that's what it was. When I saw that video, I went, that's a parable on gratitude. You know? And that's, to be honest with you, that's, that's what we're going to talk about today. today. And, I, and I have a confession to make. Many of you know that we, we take a lot of kids to Mexico, and I personally have been taking uh, young people and adults to Mexico um, from, from way back in the late 60s, uh, all through my whole ministry and youth ministry, and even here uh, uh, as a teaching pastor here. Taken, I've taken thousands and thousands of people into Mexico and in, under third world countries as well, and take them to the, the most gnarly parts, parts where you have a whole family living in a little 10 by 10 shack, you have people who have no running water uh, and, and all the things that we just take for granted, they don't, but they're within a stone's throw of the border fence and they live in dire poverty. They don't know where the next meal's coming from, living in a dollar or two a day. And I take kids down to that to, to look at that and be part of that. And, and, and there's all kinds of good reasons why, why we would do that kind of thing, many plausible reasons. Evangelism could be one of them because we work with, with groups and that gives them some street cred by people coming and doing things. Uh, and for them, uh, kindness, doing, giving a cup of cold water in the name of Jesus. But to be honest, the real reason that I do that, those are all side reasons. But the main reason I do that is because I'm hoping to cure them of a disease that's epidemic in the United States and that's the disease of ingratitude. I'm hoping that having spent time seeing how other people live and then driving across the border and realizing that, that they were just visiting poverty, they weren't living in poverty, that when they come home and they get in their bed, when they open up their refrigerator and it's packed full of stuff, when they see all the opportunities that they have, It'll well up them a sense of being thankful. And by the way, it works very often in kids. They're thankful for a week or two. 
before, before it kind of wears off, but, but, but it, oftentimes it works. Now, some kids it doesn't work. Some kids, I've seen kids it works dramatically, and these are the ones that, you know, that I like to write my books about and stuff, where they go home, they come back, and they get a side job, and they take part of that money, and they, you know, they're like, out of gratitude, they're helping somebody else get out of, out of uh, dire poverty. Are the kids, they cross the border, and they're going, lucky me, that's it, end of story. And I understand that. I understand that particularly from kids. I mean, the Bible tells us that foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. And ingratitude is part of that immature foolishness. In fact, the, the, the lack of gratitude is one of the most common complaints I hear from parents about their children. You know, my kids don't appreciate everything that we've done for them. They, they have no idea how much has been sacrificed for them. They just take everything for granted. We buy them something and they leave it out into rust. I mean, I hear those kind of stories all the time from, from parents. And as, as a mature adult, I understand that, that gratitude is something that kind of comes on you naturally. But, you know, when you see ingratitude in the part of people, sometimes it really annoys you. I, I don't know how many of you guys in your social media running around, uh, seen a video that was just released a, a week or two ago of this, this teenage girl who was about 16 years old. She just got her driver's license, 16, 17 years old, and her parents had bought her a new car. Not a new car, but bought her a car. Did you see that video? They bought her, they bought her a car. It wasn't, in fact, it was a 1992. It was a mid-sized 1992, but it was on the car lot. They had decorated with balloons on it, and they were in the family car, which is a more late, later model car, they're in the family car, and they brought her to see her, her car that was going to be, her, you know, a car that, her first car that she was going to have, bought and paid for by her parents. And, and they got the video camera out to record it because they wanted to see the reaction of, of their child to the sacrifice that they had made and the generosity that they had done. And they were so excited about it. Like I said, they decorated with balloons and everything. And so they're filming this girl, and she's sitting in the back seat of the car. She's got her earbuds on. She's looking at her phone, and they go, there's your new car, there's your car, the car we got you. This, you, know, you. Now you don't have to take the bus anymore. She doesn't even, she just kind of glances over and then looks back at her. And they go, come on, come on, get out of the car, finally. She gets out of the car, doesn't even unplug the earbuds, but she just walks like this, walks over to the car, looks at the car, turns around, walks back, and gets into the back seat of the family car. And they go, no, 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 come, come, come out, come out. Come, we're gonna open, they've opened the, the door, come look inside the car. <sighs> she walks out, she looks inside the car, and she's got a face like she's been sucking on pickles all day the whole time, you know? And I, when I, by the time I got to that, I said, I wanna turn this off, go find that girl, and just slap her up the side of the head, you know? But, but these parents were, you know, they, they were still hoping for the best. And she just looked in the car, and she walked back, and they, she just sat in the car, gloomy and bummed, like, expect me, the princess of the world, to drive a 1992 used mid-sized car? And the parents were, they, they couldn't understand. Finally, at the end of the video, the dad going, I guess we're just going to sell that car. She can take the bus. Yes, for the next 10 years. You know, they, this ingratitude of this, this gal was a stunning, right? And when you look back, maybe we see little pieces of that in our own lives, too. Or we look back and we see, you know, man, I really missed it. And as a maturing adult, I look back and there was, there's a woman that when I was 18 years old, I was getting ready to leave high school and go to Bible school, who was on a fixed income. She was a widower on fixed income. And she knew I was leaving to go to school, and she sent me five bucks a month for the six months before I left. Five bucks a month. And she was already probably in her 70s or 80s when I, when I left. And I got it, and I said, oh, how cool. But I think I only reciprocated with a thank you letter once, and I think it was because my mom said, did you ever write, her name was Mother McKibben, did you ever write Mother McKibben and say thank you for that? No, she goes, you, just, you sit down and write that, you know. Okay, so I wrote it out. But when I got older, I thought, man, what was wrong with me? When I got back, I should have looked her up, I should have taken her out for lunch or something like that or bought her flowers. Well, I didn't have any money to buy her flowers, but I could steal flowers from the neighbor and you know, bring her flowers. I, I, should have done, I should have done a lot more because this five bucks in those days for this lady was a substantial part of her social security. 
that she was giving to some kid that she barely knew. And I felt, wow, I was such an ungrateful little jerk. And I was on my way to Bible school. Ungratefulness, especially ungratefulness towards God, is considered by the Bible a very, very serious thing. It leads to a twisted soul, it leads to twisted behavior, and it's a prelude to all kinds of really vile things in life. In fact, when you look at Romans 1, you see this prelude. Romans 1, 21, it says that they, they, talking about humanity, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think of foolish ideas of what God was like. And as a result of this unthankfulness, this ingratitude on their part, their minds became dark, confused. And if you read on in this passage, there's a whole litany of really terrible things that humanity becomes because of this attitude of ignoring God and lack of gratitude and thankfulness for God. In fact, in almost any list of Bible negative stuff that's negative in the Bible, you'll find ingratitude or unthankfulness listed among them. So I was thinking, well, where does this all come from? Well, we know it comes from human nature, sort of the sin nature, and from immaturity. But I think you can trace some of it, especially in our culture, from, from people telling you that you're special. And people, you know, we live in a culture that's obsessed with letting everybody know that they're special. I mean, if your team loses in their last place, they haven't won one game, you get an award just because you're special. Well, I have, I have some really sad news for you. If people have been telling you that you're special, okay, you're not. I'm sorry, you're just not. You are not special. Okay? Now, in fact, think of this verse. Did you ever think the, that the Bible does not say that while we were yet special, Christ died for us? It says, while we were yet... Oh, you know that verse. Okay, very good. So how special are you? Not very special. Okay, now... Now you say, well, yeah, but I, what about significance? God thinks we're so worth loving that he died for us, but what makes us significant is his death on the cross and what he wants to do as a reflection of himself in us. That's how human beings become significant. We are not in and of ourselves all that particularly special. All right? and, and there are people that are famous that are not significant. And there are a lot of people who nobody's ever heard of that are extremely significant. And, and that's what God makes us. He makes us significant, not necessarily special. All right? And so people get caught up in that kind of thing. And when you think, when you somehow believe that you're extra special, and you can be special even in a victim type of way. Well, I'm special a case because I'm a victim because of people, and, and I ought to be treated. I deserve to be treated in such a way because I'm a victim of this or a victim of that. When we think that we deserve special treatment because we're special, it starts this entitlement thing in our head that we're entitled to things, that we deserve things just because of who we are. And the more entitled you feel, the less gratitude you have because why should you be grateful to something that's owed you? Right? Why should you be grateful to something that you deserve by nature of your life or whatever? And so you see people get this kind of attitude, and gratitude just vanishes when that happens. And it happens when we have expectations that aren't met. Because we're special, because we're, we deserve something, we have this expectation. That little girl in the car, she had a an idea of who she was and what she deserved to drive, and it certainly was not a 19 to 1992 used mid-sized car. She had higher expectations, and so she, she virtually showed no, added, no gratitude towards that. That makes all of us want to go and wring her neck. But I was thinking about that. I, I remember when I was like in eighth grade. When I was in eighth grade, my, my, my family ended up as a single family household. My mom was struggling to get by, and I was really big into surfing. And I had borrowed surfboards. They kept borrowing guys' surfboards. And whenever I borrowed it too long, they wanted their surfboard back, and I'd go borrow somebody else's surfboard. And that's how I was surfing, is on borrowed surfboards. And so for Christmas, when Christmas came up, I, I wanted a surfboard. And in, in that era, this is right after the movie The Endless Summer came out. 
The holy grail of surfboards, and this is for all you non-surfers, the holy grail of surfboards was a Mike Hinson model. Mike Hinson was one of the guys in, and they were made in San Diego where I lived. And it was a Mike Hinson, Gordon Smith, Mike Hinson model, which was the holy grail of surfboards. So in the surf magazines and stuff, when I told my mom I'd really like a surfboard for Christmas, I made sure to put a marker on the page that had the Mike Hinson model. And just in case she didn't get that one, I, I put it, another one on the page that had the Greg Knoll, the cat, which was another board that I really wanted, you know? And so there, and th that's, that's, that's the logos that you wanted on your surfboard, right? To show to how cool you were and, and that was the thing every, every kid wanted, those kind of surfboards. So it was Christmas morning. And I came out, and to my astonishment, there's a surfboard laying there. Okay? It was used, it was used, but there's a surfboard laying there. But it did not have a Mike Hinson sticker on it. It did not have a Greg Knoll decal on it. Instead, it had this decal. Any of you know, any of you know that surfboard make? That model? Any of you ever ride one? Well, I did. It was made by Sears and Roebuck. Seriously, Sears and Roebuck put out a surfboard. It was a, what we call pop-outs in those days, which meant they were just manufactured in a factory someplace. Nobody took any special kind for them. And, and I have to be honest, I was a grateful little brat about that surfboard. Now, looking back at it, I realized, you know, I was all caught up in what my friends would think, because, you know, you walk down there with a sport flight surfboard, and every, right away, where'd you get that? Sears and Roebuck, right? Ha, ah, you know? It was like the epitome of uncool. And, and yet, my mom scraped together all the money she could. She, she couldn't even swim, let alone think about surfing. She knew nothing about it. And she was desperately trying to, to do something out of love and sacrifice for me, and I went <laughs> to all of her efforts. Now, maybe you've got a story like that, but ingratitude comes from that kind of a thing. It even comes when we get caught up in doing good. When we get so involved in doing things that are good, good things that we lose focus on the one whom would allow us to get there to do those good things in the very beginning. The Old Testament tells a story about a group of people who are slaves under the thumb of a dictatorial regime. And through God's intervention, they were allowed to escape, an incredible escape story. And then for 40 years, they were guided and provided for in a wilderness, before they were entered to a promised land that were given of their own. And at the very end of all of that, after all those escapades and close calls and miraculous things that took place, which you can find in the book of Exodus, there's a little, real interesting little passage. Because even though this is written to the Jews, I believe it's written to all of us. It says this, for when you have become full and prosperous, when you've built fine homes to live in, and when your flocks and herds have become very large, or maybe in our case, when you no longer drive a 1992 beater, but you got a brand new car sitting in the garage, okay, and your silver and gold have multiplied along with everything else, be careful. Do not become proud at that time and forget the Lord your God who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. And it's real easy for us as believers sometimes to get so involved in all the good things that he has for us that we basically forget God. Same example played out in the New Testament, by the way. Remember the story of the ten lepers out of Luke? Ten lepers came to Jesus. Miserable disease had parted them from everybody that they knew socially, from their jobs. They were basically in dire straits. And Jesus miraculously healed them. But out of the ten that he healed, how many were grateful? One. One. 
Now, you get it. I mean, suddenly you don't have this disease anymore. You haven't hugged your children forever. Yeah, you know, you haven't, been, you haven't seen your friends or your wife. You know, you'd be booking home as fast as you can. And it was a good thing that they were healed, but they forgot the best thing, which was to give thanks and gratitude to God. And I fear that oftentimes we in our, in our lives are very much like that. And gracefulness also comes from, from being a complainer. The kind of person that sees the, the, the glass as, as consistently half full, okay? The kind of person that picks up uh, on all the little complaints and just sort of ride, rides on them, that's constantly critical, oversensitive, and becomes what other people might describe as a bummer jack or a bummer jill. By the way, there are some people I know that behind their back, that's what people call them, oh, yeah, it's bummer so-and-so. Oh, is that the tag you want on you? Because what happens when you're overly critical and you complain and you're not satisfied, it's a spirit of ungratefulness and you end up not being happy. And you know how it is when you're around somebody who's always griping and complaining and not happy? You don't want to be around them anymore, which makes them more gripe and complain and unhappy. And it's this self-fulfilling thing that ingratitude brings on some people. And the, the leaders of the Hebrews, they knew completely well that it's in our nature to be ungrateful people. They got it. Which is why they instituted in their temple rituals and things all kinds of opportunities that were sort of mandated on people in order to be grateful, expected people to do. They, they would do a thing called a thank offering. And it was, its specific intent was to remind, get people to remember what they were thankful for, where they came from, the kind of life they used to have before, before God stepped in and intervened. And so they had a thank offering. Because a lot of us, be frank, need a lot of reminders about that. I mean, I'm always astonished with the amount of bounty and wonder and good that we have that, that the most attended service of the year isn't the Thanksgiving Eve service. As a matter of fact, the Wednesday night Thanksgiving Eve service is the least attended service of all the services we do. And I've always thought, well, that is so weird. Because if there's anything that we ought to be moving heaven and earth to get to, it's an opportunity to, to verbally praise God with our brothers and sisters. And so it's, we are not far from how the Hebrews were. We need to learn and, and be taught those kinds of things and practice those kinds of things. And, and they made it part of their, their hymnology to remind people over and over again. They said, make thankfulness our sacrifice to God. Make thankfulness thankfulness our sacrifice. So this morning we're going to do something a little bit different. Um, most of you have an envelope, I mean you have a piece of paper and a pen that you were given inside your bulletin. And if you don't, Kelly, could you grab some extra ones if, we, if, if you need? If you put your hand up, Kelly will give you one. And what we're going to do right now is, is we're, going to take, we're going to take a thank offering. And what we'd like you to do is just right up here too, Kelly, we got some folks that need some. Um, but what I'd like you to do is think of one thing that you're thankful for. One thing that you're thankful for. And I'd like you to write it down as a praise to God and fold it in half. And what we're going to do is we're going to collect these. We're not going to read them. We're not going to read them out loud because this is your expression to God. This is a thank offering. We're imitating the Hebrews. They brought goats, pigs, I mean not pigs, goats, chickens, stuff like that, um, birds, but, but they didn't, but they didn't do what we're doing right now. And what we're doing right now is, is giving our words to God, directly to God, as a thank offering. So we're going to play a little tune while you write something, and then we're going to, there's some more folks over here that need. Um, and then we're guys who collect the offering, if you don't mind getting the baskets and, and passing those in just a second, okay? And we're going to collect that as a thank offering. As the bull is going around, let me point out one other thing. Um, We as Christians, the primary reason we act in a Christian way is not just because we know it's good for us, we know it pleases God, we know that our lives will be better if we do. The reason Christians act in, a, in the way they do is out of gratitude towards God. Because of what he's done to us, as we look at Christians, what he's done for us, 
We say, how could I live my life any different? How could I, how could I ever act any different, considering in the light of what Christ has done for us? It's the reason we Christians act as Christians, is, is out, of, out of gratitude. And that gratitude is one that spills over in our everyday behavior so that we act that out when we look and we, we, we begin to look through the, the world not in the eyes that we're special and we deserve something, but there were just people that were rescued out of slavery, snatched out of the flames. And that's how we, we respond to them because, because gratitude is actually an action word. It demands a response. It wants something to do it. So it's not good enough to say, well, in my head, I am thankful. In my head, yeah, I really appreciate my parents. In my head, I appreciate this person, that person. In my head, I do that. What good is that? It's a good first step. But it's an action word and means it, it demands a response. And for some of you, that might be just what we did right now, to, to just take the moment to verbally respond to God, just to offer prayers of, of thanksgiving. For some, it might be just take a step further and, and write a thank you note or pick up the phone or shoot an email to somebody and go, you know what? I really appreciate you. Like I said, we're not going to collect and read these but you just participated in a thank offering this morning because gratitude is important. So in closing this morning, I thought I would do something politically incorrect. I know that's novel for you if you know me, but since we have a national holiday coming up on, on Thursday, I thought it might be interesting to allow a politician to have the final word this morning. And... Uh, so in closing this morning, we're going to have a few last words that actually come from the White House itself. And, and look, yes, I know that this president knows that he is speaking to a divided nation, and I know that many think he's a buffoon, but don't storm out. Please hear him out, because I think, I think this president nails it. So we're going to give you a chance to hear from the White House this morning. It is the duty of nations as well as of men to own their dependence upon the overruling power of God, to confess their sins and transgressions in humble sorrow, yet with assured hope that genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon, and to recognize the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures and proven by all history that those nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. And insomuch as we know that by His divine law, nations like individuals are subjected to punishments and chastisements in this world, may we not justly fear that the awful calamity of civil war which now desolates the land may be but a punishment inflicted upon us for our presumptuous sins to the needful end of our national reformation as a whole people? We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God that made us. It has seemed to me fit and proper that they should be solemnly, reverently, and gratefully acknowledged as with one heart and one voice by the whole American people. I do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States and also those who are at sea and those who are sojourning in foreign lands to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November as a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwelleth in the heavens. We'll give you a
Have a terrific, grateful, thankful Thanksgiving. God bless you. Thanks for being with us.